Well, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, men this morning. I think some of you uh, can see empty seats. Some desperate men are uh, trying to get ready for what's about to hit them. What, do you have exams this week? Next week? Uh, so you're, you're feeling the heat, and that's good. Uh, when we first started uh, seminary here, uh, I used to teach um, the preaching classes. And uh, the first preaching class, we had the class in here. Um, I gave them an assignment. The first assignment I gave them in, in the class, at the very outset of the class, um, to turn in a, a paper. I think it had to do with um, kind of getting a biblical perspective on the church and what the, what the important um, foundational elements of a, of a church would be and... Um, and I said, I want it in a certain day. Um, about half the class uh, turned it in. The other half said, you know, I'm almost finished. So I, I gave two grades. I gave A's and F's. And everybody said, well, well um, you know, my wife was sick. Uh, we had a baby, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and I'll have it for you. <laughs> I'll have it for you Monday. And I just stopped and I said, okay, let's just, here's your first lesson. There are no Monday sermons. <laughs> You're going to spend your whole life making sure you are ready Sunday. So your first test was whether or not you could be ready on the day that was assigned. Um, there were many pleas for mercy, which was not rendered. <laughs> And guys have long forgotten everything else I said in that entire semester, but they know there are no Monday sermons. So uh, hitting deadlines is what we do, right? Absolutely what, th this is your life. Get ready for it. Since 1969, I've had to be ready every Sunday since 1969 in my life. If it's not here, it's somewhere else. But it's always Sunday. Always Sunday. So being able to uh, meet deadlines is part of the discipline of uh, ministry. The, I don't know that, there, I guess there are other jobs like that. If you're a surgeon, you have to show up when the patient is under anesthesia. Um, you, you can't miss that. But again, you don't have to necessarily prepare something new for that event. You take your skill and it's just a different body but the same skill. But in, in the ministry, you, you not only have to be ready on Sunday, but you have to be ready to say something that truly represents the revelation of God. And generally speaking, say it to the same people who've heard you for weeks and weeks and months and months and years and years and not put them to sleep in the first 15 minutes. So uh, the challenge is uh, to make sure that you're still saying something fresh, compelling, um, that captures their heart. That, that's, uh, that's a great challenge. There was a, a British orator who said one time the most paralyzing thought he ever had was that he might have to speak to the same audience three times. We, we would generally do that every Sunday. At least for me, it's three times on Sunday. So uh, this is all part of the discipline. Well, I could rattle on and on, but I won't do that. Um, I was asked if I would just uh, kind of throw this open and let you ask some questions. We'll have a little kind of uh, dialogue uh, informally this morning. So whatever's on your heart. I, I think somebody has a microphone. There's a man with a microphone in each hand in the back. So if anybody has a question, put your hand up. It can, it can be anything, uh, anything that might be on your mind, any way that we can be of help to you. Uh, if you can move your mind away from the things that you're studying, we'll, uh, just give me your name, stand up and give me your name and Fire the question. Hi, sir. My name is Patrick, and uh, Hi, I wanted to ask you about uh, your time management. Uh, specifically, I know that in addition to being a pastor of a huge church, you're also president of the seminary, president of the college, TMAI, and there are probably a lot of other things that I don't know about. So how do you organize your week? How do you prioritize, and how do you also guard time with your family? Yeah, this is a question I've been asked a lot, and I don't know that there's a fixed answer to that. The good news is I love my wife uh, more than anybody else I know, I love my children more than anybody else's children. So I'm compelled. <laughs> in fact, other people's children can be very irritating. But uh, it's amazing how when my kids did the same thing that your kids did, my kids didn't irritate me. But 
yours did. Um, I, I think there's the, the 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 compelling reality in my in my life has always been my love for my family. Um, I, I I understand also that uh, if I can't manage my own household well, I don't have any business managing the church. So the priority in my life has been the the salvation and sanctification of my own children, and that extends even to the grandchildren. Uh, as much as I have the the opportunity to do that. So it is that driving responsibility in my heart that before God called me to pastor somebody else's kids, he called me to pastor my own, to shepherd my own, to shepherd my wife in the process. And uh, um, so that's been a priority for me. And I can't really say that that means that it translates into some kind of schedule. It uh, translates into sensitivity. It translates into uh, listening ears. It translates into trying to sense when maybe um, I haven't been around enough and I need to be around more. Uh, sometimes my, my family is very verbal. Patricia's, uh, there, there are no mysteries about Patricia. I know exactly what she's thinking because she tells me, which is really helpful most of the time. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, you, that, that's, you don't want somebody not saying what's concerning them, particularly to a husband, uh, or for that matter, to a wife. So, yeah, so that that's just a an overall priority. I didn't want to lose my kids. I kind of had a principle early on that uh, I would go to their events if they would come to my sermons. So that's kind of how it worked. Um, and that's always been a priority. I didn't want to lose my family. And uh, throughout the years, what that means if you're a pastor initially is that you're in control of your time. You don't punch a clock. Uh, so you need to you need to set your your life in a place where you can make the maximum impact on your family. Even in the early years of ministry, when a lot was going on around here, I refused to go to every meeting that occurred every night of the week. I, somebody else could decide what color to paint something. Somebody else can decide whether to to do, do this or do that or whatever other strategies or necessities came up in the life of the church. I didn't need to be a part of that. I always felt that if I deferred leadership, I would produce leadership. But if I took over everything and ran everything, I would produce no leadership. Um, you literally stunt people. So the more freedom you give to people, the more they develop leadership. Because freedom creates leaders because you can't be an effective leader unless you've learned to fail. So when you're developing leaders in your church, if you don't give them the freedom to fail, they'll never succeed. The only way you really succeed is when you have felt the pain of failure. So gulp a little bit, swallow hard, and let people make mistakes. Because in the, lo- in the end of that, th- that, that's a path that you've been on yourself, and that's how you develop leaders. Leaders learn to be confident in the decisions they make by making bad decisions. Good leaders make second, good second decisions. All good leaders make good second decisions. Bad leaders... Um, will make a decision and then try to justify it when it's a bad one. Good leaders will make a bad decision and turn it over because they don't want to live with the consequences of a bad decision, which all of us have made. So the way that works for me, that works for everybody else. So you, you need to, if you want to spread leadership and spread responsibility and spread the load, then you have to let people have the freedom to fail and to feel the pain of that. And they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. So, um, that was kind of the pattern for me. That's how it all started. As ministry began to develop, I, I remember being in this chapel in the first years and saying, look, I can't do more than I can do humanly. So if you all decide there's a ministry that needs to happen, go do that. Just go use your gifts, do the ministry, find some other people who want to help you do it, and go do it. And just just do it. Do it spontaneously. Do it independently. Do it personally. If you have a few other people that want to do it, I don't know whether it's a Bible study at the jail or, or whatever it is, a neighborhood evangelism, go do whatever you want to do. Uh, if it gets to a point where you, you need help because you need uh, finances or you need more manpower, then come and let us know and we'll help you take it to the next level. And that's always the way ministry started here in this church. Uh, guys started t- um, putting together uh, tapes of my message in the days when they were reel to reel. When I first came, it was reel to reel, big reels like this. And there were people who recorded the message and then made copies of these big reels. And then somebody invented the cassette. And of course, I've lived through the cassette, the CD, 
and now the download, MP3. Uh, but it's always been somebody else who did that. I mean, that was always the strategy. So the, the, the years have allowed us to see these people who have these desires and passions and gifts for developing various kinds of ministries uh, you, you create the vi- environment for that by teaching the Word of God, by holding them responsible, by talking about their, their gifts, by unleashing them to do whatever it is that's in their heart to do, and letting them follow the direction and the leading of the Spirit of God in their own lives, and then just coming alongside and help them. Uh, if, if I try to start everything, then I've got to keep it going, and I can't run down the line and keep spinning the plates on the sticks. So Grace to You starts that way. Uh, the people at the Master's uh, University came to me and said, look, we've got a faculty, we've got a staff, we've got students, we, we just need leadership. So I provide leadership primarily uh, to, the, to the main administrative people there. The same would be true in the seminary, the same would be true at Grace to You. Um, there are other functions. But it's really no different in my life than somebody who has... Uh, is a president of a corporation that has multi phases of operation, and over all those operations, there are various people. It would be very difficult to step into this, so you sort of have to grow up in it, uh, which is what's happened to me. But I, I'm today basically doing what I've always done uh, preparing to preach and teach the word every single week, preaching the word, working on books, now finish the commentaries, the uh, going through the theology, all of that. Now there's a few more books. Uh, Gospel According to Paul is now finished. Uh, the next one is The Gospel According to God, Isaiah 53. I'm, I'm still basically doing what I've always done and then meeting with key leaders in these various ministries that God has raised up. Uh, at the same time, wanting to be available to my family, um, to my wife, and particularly now that the kids are gone, you know, I'm, it's the two of us. So that, that's, a, that's a blessing and a priority. Um, in some ways, this is the measure of your relationship when all the kids are gone and you're just looking at each other every day. Um, this part of life, you want to be sure that when you get here, you're happy to be looking into each other's eyes uh, because that's what life comes to on a personal level. So I, don't, I, I can't answer that question by saying there's some kind of pattern in my life, except I used to talk about planned neglect. I plan to neglect everything but the priorities and the priorities for me were always the spiritual life of my family and the preparation of the Word of God and the proclamation of the Word of God. That was always it. Uh, I plan to neglect everything else. And then when I'm done with all those things that most matter, fit other things into, their, into the categories that were left in my schedule. Uh, but in order to see the range of ministry that we have developed as it has today, you have to, you have to feel secure in what you're doing and unleash people to do whatever it is that God has gifted them and called them to do and let them go at it and not micromanage it. If you micromanage somebody, you don't need them. If you're going to be an effective leader, you have to give away responsibility, which means you have to let people fail because you never succeed until you've tried and failed and said, I'm not doing that again. Everybody needs to eat crow along the way. Everybody needs to experience failure. Everybody needs to fall short because when you've had the pain of doing that, you're not going to do it again. You're going to do something different. You're going you're to think, think more about it, get better counsel or whatever. So I think the thing that served me best through the years was the sense that I did not need to be in charge of everything. I don't view myself that way. If the Lord took it all away to tomorrow, fine. I, I, I'm not personally invested in anything. If the Lord said, you know, go to Africa as, as a missionary, great, I'll go tomorrow. Uh, this is just his work. I've just tried to do what I can do, and I can't do this without... Um, huge number of people who have grown through the years of this developing ministry into positions of responsibility. And every generation, by the way, as the years go by, every generation gets better than the one before. I'm a better preacher now than I was in the past. The people in leadership 
uh, are, are the new generation is always a step ahead of the old generation. Why? Because they build on all that was the strength of the previous generation and they bring in their understanding of the next generation and add to it. So it accumulates. So it all gets better and better, especially if it's all basically tied to the integrity of Scripture. So you have to be patient to see things develop in that way. But, but you just need to learn along the way. You, you, you don't tie your own sense of well-being or security to other people's success. Give them the freedom to fail, or you're going to wind up micromanaging everybody and drive yourself crazy. Um, you, can, you can do what you do to the best of your ability and trust that the Lord is going to bless the people who are working alongside of you give them the freedom to fail so they can succeed. I've actually hired people and said to them, you know, I don't know what it is that you can do well, but I like you. I think you're devoted. Go find something to do and we'll pay you. (laughs) Really? Look, it's people to me. It's always people. It's never about systems, programs. It's always just surround me with the best people. And they'll figure out how to do ministry. They'll figure out where the needs are. They'll find the places where the needs are, and they'll go make it happen. And then what I do is try to invest in their lives as a positive influence. Long answer. Sorry. Okay. Another question? Anywhere? Uh, Hello. My name is Bart. And my question is, when you first came to Grace Church, uh, was there any leader or even unsaved leader fighting against the change you want to make? Yeah, and, uh, there, were, there were a lot of unsaved leaders. Okay, and what do you do about it? And how much do you involve your wife in uh, this kind of struggle? How much Thank do you. I what? Uh, involve your wife in this kind of struggle. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, my wife um, feels deeply about things. She, she's not a superficial person, so... I don't tell her anything that unnecessarily would disturb her. I can bear those things myself. I want her to be joyful and happy, and I, want, I don't want to go home and, and debate issues that are going on here that she can't fix. So if she finds out about it, then I can't help it. But uh, backing up to the, the, the question, yeah, when I came here, there were unsaved people. There were a lot of different things organizationally. There, there was not a group of elders that basically were the leaders of the church. There were all kinds of different boards. The church had been basically founded by a guy who was a Methodist. Uh, it was a plant from Trinity Methodist down in L.A. So the theology was typically Arminian. The doctrinal statement was non-existent, didn't have one. Um, we had uh, unconverted people... Um, teaching classes. We had unconverted people on boards. We had unconverted people in the choir. So my first Sunday here, right here in this place, I preached on Matthew 7. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. That was my first sermon here. Well, that'll tell you how bold I was out of the blocks or how stupid either (laughs) one. Um, You know, it's just, it's so interesting that you ask that question because when I go back to that, I, I have sort of established myself as somebody who is concerned about false salvation. Would that be true? Gospel according to Jesus, gospel according to the apostles, now the gospel according to Paul, ashamed of the gospel, and five other books or or more books that, that target the issue of unregenerate people in the church and what is real salvation. And, and I mean, I'm tracking with the, I don't know if you've been watching the Tully and Chavidjian drama that's playing out. He was in it. He was an antinomian. I said this years ago, antinomians adapt that theology because of their sinful pattern and their irresponsibility. And of course, now it's come out woman after woman after woman after woman, and that, that you can always know that that's behind the scenes. So I've always been concerned about a sound soteriology, sound doctrine of salvation. And I, I look back and realize that that was, God had already planted that in my heart before I ever got here. And it had to do with a, with a buddy of mine, um, we played football together in college, and we were tandem in the backfield, and he went to, to seminary, and, and um, he was teaching a Bible study, and I was teaching a Bible study, and he abandoned the faith. I went to Talbot Seminary. The dean's son was my good friend there. He abandoned the faith. 
So I was process, in high school, I had a friend named Ralph who, who was involved with some ministry with me. He abandoned the faith. So these were three close friends, high school, college, and seminary, who all abandoned the faith. I had never, I, I was trying to figure out what in the world is going on with these people. I grew up in a kind of an evangelistic environment with my dad. I don't think I ever heard him preach on the difference between false faith and true faith but it was pretty clear to me that there were people on the board in his church that did not know the Lord because they, they, they scandalized the church at some point. So when I came here, that was, that was a huge issue. So on that first Sunday, I preached, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord. And I, I just went after that issue um, at the outset. Um, that set a tone. People began to, uh, to leave the church. Uh, board members over a period of time resigned. Um, there was a couple, there was a church pianist, uh, Bible teacher, Sunday school teacher, high profile leader in the church who wanted me to marry his daughter to a non-Christian. In the first few months, I said, I can't do that. I won't do that. That's unequally yoking. So I was called into the meeting of the church leaders and they said, well, you know, he's, he's a very high profile in the church. You, you need to do this because I, I said, I, I'm not going to do it. And one of the guys said, well, okay, well, then you don't need to do it if it bothers your conscience, but um, we'll let him have it at the church. So I said to them at the meeting, I said, whose church is this? Is this your church or is this Christ's church? Are you going to decide that you can dishonor Christ in his church? I mean, this is out of the gate. I'm in my 20s. And I'm confronting this, and uh, I remember that person saying, no, we can't do it. Well, the fallout of not being willing to do that was to lose a church pianist, a Sunday school teacher, a leader in the church, and his entire family. And then the, 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 the thing began to escalate, and other people began to see that this was going down a path that they weren't really too thrilled about. But at the same time, the Word of God was doing its work in a powerful way early on, and there was an influx coming into the church of people who were hungry for the Word of God. Remember, there was no one doing Bible exposition. I didn't think anybody in L.A. was doing it. So this was new, and there were some really godly people, wonderful people who responded positively. So we weathered those early years. I never, I, I did confront it at a leadership level, and I did confront it at a pulpit level. I, I hope I spoke the truth in love. You can go back and listen to that opening message if you want and decide but, um, but I knew I had to confront that. I also knew I had to pull the leaders around me um, so that I could kind of win them over to the truth. So I started a Saturday men's um, Bible study. Saturday morning it went on for about eight years and uh, t- told the leaders, the men in leadership, they needed to come and any other men. And so for about eight years, I met every Saturday morning, took them through systematic theology because I couldn't wait for the exposition to create the theology. I had to give them the theology along the way. So it began to, it, the, the scripture began to take over the church. And as that happened, um, uh, I remember <laughs> there was a guy who really resented me coming here. His name was Frank. And uh, the first Sunday they introduced me, he got up and he introduced me in a very disparaging way. We've got some young kid who thinks he's smart enough to lead this church. Uh, and this was, he was in this this place right here, saying that to the church. Um, so it was very, I was, there were people who were very disparaging of my coming. And uh, I remember, it was a great big guy. So one day I went up to him, put my arm part way around him and uh, <laughs> on his shoulder. And I said, Frank, if there's anything I can ever do to minister to you and uh, to, uh, to be of help or encouragement to you, I just want you to know that I want to do that. Um, and I think he kind of melted a little bit at that, but there, there was some serious hostility here. There were people who left the church, people in leadership, people in teaching responsibility. Um, there was a teacher who was teaching error. So I, I said, you can't teach here anymore. And it was a Sunday school teacher. And so that entire class did a patio protest. They went out in the patio, refused to come to the service, sat out there in a, pro, in a silent protest. So I called them all in. And, and I just, I read them the scripture, are you not carnal? Are you not carnal? And divisive. And I just, I didn't know anything to do the, other than to confront it in the context of now we're going to be dominated by the word of God. 
So yeah, there were, there were those kinds of conflicts. And I, I will just say this, it could have been on a human level that, that I, could have, I could have sent myself packing with that approach. But God was gracious, and it was God's purpose for me to stay, so I survived that. Uh, and I was confident in the Scripture, and I, I wasn't attacking other things. I was just proclaiming the truth. And the issue became, are we going to go with the Word of God or are we not? And I kept making that the issue. Do you want to do it biblically or not? Because you're going to have to tell me, if you don't want to do it biblically, then you need to say that. Um, so the, in the process, there were non-Christians who, who left. There were perhaps Christians who, uh, who didn't want to go by the Word. Uh, so yeah, we had a, a bit of an undoing but the church doubled in the first couple of years and then doubled again in the next couple, then doubled again because the Word was doing a, an amazing work. And so the folks who were genuine uh, were basically validated and affirmed in the direction the church was, was going. But yes, that. Um, part of what I tried to do also just to fully answer that question was to talk personally to someone who felt negative about me and see if I couldn't build a relationship to that person. Um, but primarily, I just kept poking the question at them, do you want to do this biblically or not? Do you want to go by the Word of God or not? Just let me know that. This isn't about me. This is about whether or not you want a church that's based on the Word of God. And they had already begun to feel the impact of Scripture. And, and just along that line, guys, if you get into that situation, you don't want to start by teaching um, Ephesians on how to run the church. I started in the Gospel of John because nobody argued with Jesus. Nobody argued. Nobody complained about Christ week after week after week after week. So that was when I first came. And as you know, I just finished John. So it sort of began and ended with that. Okay? Any other? We have some up in the front if you can... We're making our way up here. We'll get to you, Bruce. Um, first, thank you for uh, taking the time with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, they, I mean, is, the, uh, I, look, the they, they don't invite me here very often, so yeah. I think it's a great... <laughs> the wisdom is priceless. We're very thankful. Um, <laughs> um, question. In the, if you could look back, uh, back to the beginning, over the 50 years, looking back to the beginning of all of this, and uh, even in a context of a church plant in the first couple of years... What do you see kind of the, the three or four things that you think are the most important to be established and start looking towards those things? Yeah, just, it's, just, it's, not, it's not complicated. The first thing is you have to be relentlessly biblical because the argument's always got to be over the Scripture. You, you can't be the issue. Uh, and, and that was crystal clear from the get-go. The first time I ever stood up in this pulpit, this very place decorated a little differently. Those windows were here. But stood up in this place. I, I spent an hour, this was, as a, <laughs> this was as a candidate, I guess. They invited me to preach. I spoke for an hour and a half on a Sunday night on Romans 6 and 7. Um, we just went into the Word of God on the issue of the believer's nature and sanctification because it was on my heart. So they knew from the get-go that that was, that was going to be um, the nature of the ministry. They, they had not experienced that in the life of this church in the, in the past. So that was the first thing, was to just continue to, to take them to Scripture and let the debate or the argument be with the text of Scripture. The second thing, and I think this is so very, very important, is to demonstrate a genuine love and affection for the people. It's amazing how many guys can get their doctrine right and make absolutely no connection to the people. You cannot shepherd people uh, unless you demonstrate love to them. I mean, you're just a clanging cymbal. You're just a banging gong without love. And loving those people is a challenge. Uh, loving them means... Um, patiently instructing them, right? But we're preaching the Word, but with all what? Patience. 
patience. Uh, I didn't have a lot of patience. I still don't have as much as I probably should have. But the Lord was gracious to me. So it was a question of making the, the, the word of God the issue, not making me the issue, keeping myself out of it. One of the things I see in so many preachers today that is so dangerous is that they are the heroes of all their own stories. You don't ever want to be the hero of any story you tell. You're, you're not a hero. You're a servant. You don't ever want to use yourself as the model of spirituality. This is irritating to people, and it's self-promoting. So it was always about the Scripture, and that's why starting with Christ is so important, because if you start a ministry looking at Christ, you aren't going to be the hero. He is. So you're elevating them at the very outset. And then loving them means patiently enduring uh, the process of getting them to where the Word of God will eventually take them. I would think that most guys, in fact, I, I don't know that I can remember a time hearing that a church threw, out a, 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 threw back out a guy because of his preaching. When people go to a church and the church doesn't accept them, it's, it's not the preaching. It's, it's the, the absence of effective affection and communion with the saints there. That is really critical. And I think, again, what I said earlier is so important. If you let them know that you trust them by deferring responsibility and leadership to them without high control, uh, they get the picture. I trust you. I trust what you're doing. You want to do that? Go do that. Come to me if you need some help. But I, I, I want you to use your gifts. I want you to do the things that are in your heart. I want this church to be full of people who are ministering. And very early on, when we were still in this building, Moody Monthly, which was a national magazine, came and said, we, we don't know what's going on in your church. We want to do an article. So they did, uh, they interviewed a bunch of people around here. And the article, you can maybe look it up, is the church with 900 ministers. We had 900 people. And Moody's take was, we had 900 ministers in this church. And that, again, is a reflection of security on your part. If you feel that um, you've got to control everything because you might fail, that, that's a problem with your ego. You, you just need to do what God has gifted you and called you to do, and you need to give people the freedom to serve. So when Moody comes here and they assess this church, the guy goes away and writes an article called The Church with 900 Ministers. He just saw people doing all kinds of things. Did they all do it right? Did they all do it to the best of their ability? No, but did they all do it? They were working. They were serving. They were doing the best they could. It was going to take some years for me to ramp up their theological understanding and their spiritual maturity to make it everything it should be, but that was true of me. The other thing is to invest in men. When you think about the strategy of the Lord, I was talking to a guy on the phone on the way in this morning. The strategy the Lord had was to go into come into the world, <laughs> this would have been a strange strategy for people living in today's world. Uh, God had a plan to send his son into the world to spend three years with 12 guys. You would say, that's ridiculous. But apart from the Holy Spirit, it would have been, but empowered by the Holy Spirit, they turned the world upside down. So again, it's, what, it's the investment that you make in men so that all that ministry that's being proliferated has leadership in and around it. That's why that Saturday study with men teaching them sound doctrine was so very important. Um, in the process, and this is really important, make sure that your family supports what you preach by investing in them. That, well, that's, you know, that's been a blessing here um, through all these years to know that, that your family supports what you do. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know that there's anything beyond that. I, I would just say, um, in terms of preparation, just master the text. We're teaching you how to do it. Just do it week after week after week, and you'll preach with power and effectiveness. Okay? Yes, Bruce, I think, had a question up here.
Pastor John, sometimes I uh, struggle with my own, uh, if I'm uh, using my own personal finances correctly, uh, am I being too selfish thinking oh, I got three kids, you know, college costs a lot of money, try to save, uh, you know, retirement's out there, who knows how much any of us will ever need and you can never save enough. Uh, Francis Chan, one of our own graduates, you know, from what I understand, sold his own house. Um, Luke 14 talks about, uh, if you want to be my disciple, uh, give away all your possessions. How does it go right here? Yeah, just, sure. Yeah, no one can be my disciple who does not give away all his own possessions. Um, what principles do you use in your life with, you know, I'm saving for the future, I'm sacrificing for the Lord, I'm being a giving person, and I know that you are that type of person who has a generous heart. I don't think I would really say uh, that's my description, but I struggle with that. Sure. Good, good. And you, uh, of all people who have served as a missionary in the Ukraine, how many years? 24 years. I've been to your house. You're not overdoing it, Bruce. <laughs> if I remember, I had to walk up 11 flights of stairs in the dark to get to your house. Well, how many flights were you up? Only eight. Only eight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I, uh, and what a precious family. I'll, I'll never forget dinner. We had a wonderful dinner that night, didn't we? You were invited again to our house. Oh, thank you. No, I, I think you're a million miles from that. Look, we have to remember that it's God who gives you the power to get well, that uh, when God blesses us with much, then we are, we are stewards of much. Um, what our Lord is saying in those kind of gospel statements is that unless you're willing to give up everything to embrace him, you're not worthy to be his disciple. If you're, if you're going to go home and wait for your inheritance, you know, in, the, in the, the words of Jesus, or if you're not willing to uh, hate your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, and even your own life and, you know, the rich young ruler, th those, those were our Lord's tests for the level of commitment to him as Lord. Um, but again, Look, the Lord has blessed me with more than I need, much more than I need. And I recognize I need to be a steward of that, uh, and I need to use those resources wisely. Um, you have to stop short of um, excessive indulgence, but be grateful for what the Lord provides for you and for your family. Uh, it's, Im it's important to me that, uh, that I understand that Everything that I receive financially, I am a steward of. Not just what I give to the Lord, every dime of it. I'm, I'm accountable to God for how it's used. Um, and I, you know, we, we uh, have lived in the same home since uh, 1980, 36 years. We raised our kids there. We, we had our whole family over on Thanksgiving, and we used to think it was a big house, but that's because the kids were little. Now it's a small house because all of them are big. And, uh, but that's our home. And that's, that's the home that our family's always known. Um, I'm content with that. Um, you don't see it all the time, but I, my car is a 2002 Toyota. That's my own car. Galpin Ford gives me cars to drive. That's why you always see me in a different car. Bert Bachman, who owns Galpin Ford, just is very good to about four or five pastors, and he gives us a, what's essentially a loaner car to drive as much as we want to drive it. So I think you can, you can make wise investments. That's important as well, so that you can uh, pass something on to your children. I mean, in the, in the parable of the, of the prodigal, the, 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 the owner, the father, who has the large estate is Christ, and um, he uses a man with a large estate, not only there, but in many other parables, as something as a, as a valid reality in life. Jesus even said, the poor you always have with you, but God not intending everybody to be poor. I, I sometimes think the less you have, the easier it is, because the more you have, the more complicated it gets. And that's what it says in Proverbs, as, incre as riches increase, so do those who devour it. Um, the simpler, the better. I, I would downsize tomorrow if I could. Uh, my... I don't attach any personal value to stuff, but I can't say that about the rest of my family. Um, sometimes the conversation goes like this. Uh, why, why do we still have this thing around? Well, so-and-so gave that to us. 
So-and-so's been in heaven for 15 years. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> you had that conversation? <laughs> I'm pretty much a pragmatist. <laughs> Um, when the fire came by, you know, I it missed our house, but I thought, man, if it just had taken the garage. <laughs> that would have solved endless decisions. I think it's, um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about it is um, I've always loved to give, always been a, a joy to give. But I just can't get ahead of the Lord. He just keeps supplying. He just keeps uh, showing himself faithful. And I think uh, that God wants, once you, once you have demonstrated that you can be trusted to disperse what he gives you and use it for his glory, you'll become a channel for that. So. And that's it. Well, it's more blessed to what? Give. Yeah. Okay, we have time maybe for one more question, if there is one. Anybody? Not necessary. Okay. I think we have somebody in the back. Um, hi. Uh, I have a question about, uh, can you kind of walk us through your process of how you choose what you're going to teach next, whether it's your series on Sunday nights or, mm. or which book you're going to go through on, on Sunday mornings? Yeah, I don't know that there's any particular process. Um, you know, as an expositor, I only have to make that decision uh, once every four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't come up very often. <laughs> so um, for a while, it, 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 you know, when I was going through the New Testament, there were some reasons um, why I chose books, the life of the church, the condition of the church, the state of the church outside our own local church, my own desire, uh, what I thought would be good for the people. I mean, I, there are lots of things like that that came up. But once I make that decision, it's, it's a long time before I have to make it again. Now, in a, I did a recent series on 1 Corinthians 15 on resurrection. That was suggested by one of the guys here, one of the uh, pastors here, that, that, that he thought that would be a really good series to do. I have just in the last maybe week, um, it's been suggested to me that it's been so many years since I did an epistle. Again, this was suggested to me by somebody here. You should do an epistle. Many of these people have never heard you teach an epistle. And uh, the, the one epistle that I, I haven't done in fact, I think I first did it in 1973, and I think it, is, it speaks poignantly to the situation of the church today, theologically, is Galatians, which deals with the issue of legalism and, and um, antinomianism or libertinism. So again, it's conversations, it's uh, what, what might be most helpful. So those things just kind of play into it, and uh, I will once we get into the first of the year on Sunday morning, start a series in Galatians. I think it'll be great to go back to it. I, I did it early because there were some compelling reasons why at that time. But if you look at the commentaries, Ephesians essentially has this similar number of chapters, but the volume on Ephesians is double that on Galatians, and Galatians deserves more attention than I gave it early on. Uh, so I, 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 it's just a combination of what, I, what I'm hearing from people, what they would desire, what they feel would be best for our our church, and this is a time, by the way, when um, sin is is ubiquitous at a level that it's never been. So, how do you deal with sin? How do you deal with it when it is coming at you uh, the way it is through the media? This is a good time to make sure you know the, the the biblical path of sanctification, which is neither legalism nor libertinism. Um, both of those are wrong relationships to the law. Yeah, somebody who's an antinomian, you might say, is a lawless person. No, they're not. They, they are they're very much like a legalist. They connect their Christian life to the law, either to the um, adherence to the law or to the indifference to the law. But it's in both cases, they're in the same zone. They're defining spirituality as a relationship to the law without understanding grace. 
which is what the whole point, the whole point of Galatians is about grace. Um, and either anonomianism, libertinism, or legalism is a wrong relationship to the law. You think of those people as opposites. They're not. They're, they're in the same box. They're defining spirituality by the relationship to the law. Either a relationship that gives it too great a place or too small a place. In either case, it's the law that they're reacting to. And the law, we know, can't restrain sin. So legalists have the same problem that libertines have. They're hypocrites. They're covering something. So those are the kinds of issues. Uh, and so we'll, I'll dig a little around with uh, some of our pastoral staff guys and uh, talk about how, what, what issues would you see that need to be addressed from Galatians, and I think that's what I'm going to do. But again, in answer to the question, it's, um, it's kind of how the Lord directs me and as I listen to the people around me and as I look at what is best at a given period of time. Nothing more than that. Okay? Our time is gone, and I know you're in a hurry to get to class. Right? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for a wonderful, wonderful opportunity just to be with these precious men. Thank you for their faithfulness, giftedness, their calling, having been set apart the proclamation of your word and to shepherd your flock. Bless them, especially, Lord, grant them grace in the next week as they go through their tests and their final papers. And Lord, may you show yourself faithful to them. May they be diligent in the days ahead to accomplish what you've given them with joy and excellence. Thank you for their, their professors, the faculty, all who lead them here. Bless them and continue to cause them all to flourish and to know your blessing. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.